Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today um, on another interactive webinar on writing review article guide for beginners. So this is a ongoing series, but this one is um, uh, organized by Nishtar alumni of North America, their research council, um, and also in collaboration of uh, Pakistani Association of Psychiatrists of North America. So we welcome all of you. Thank you for joining. And I think we are really lucky uh, to have a really well-renowned um, presenter with us who have been mentoring so many of us, including me and, and many international medical graduate, human graduates from here, uh, Dr. Sadiq Naveed, who is a lead inpatient child and adolescent psychiatrist at Institute of Living Hartford in Connecticut. Uh, he is currently president of Nishtar Alumni of North America. He is on board of trustee of Pakistani Association of Psychiatrists of North America. And he has done his MPH. He has written many articles, systematic review, um, and done a lot of research. And uh, we are really grateful uh, that you know he was able to spare his time. So I will really uh, encourage you to, you know, so after the presentation, you know, uh, ask the question and Dr. Naveed will go over, you know, some rules, um, how he would like to proceed his presentation. We were uh, unfortunate in a way that Dr. Fozia Zubair Arayan, who is a chair of our media committee in Papana, who was supposed to be uh, the uh, uh, mediator for today, she has not been feeling well, so we pray that she feels better and without any delay. I will request Dr. Sadiq Naveed uh, to start his presentation. And thank you again, everyone. And thank you especially to Dr. Naveed uh, for agreeing to presenting on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Zishan. So uh, I'm gonna start, but first I wanna do some housekeeping things. Um, how many of you know how to raise hands in Zoom? So if you know it, can you guys raise your hands? So it's on your right-hand side, there is a participant bar. Okay, I see. Two hands. Okay, good. Awesome. So it's on your right hand bar, and I will say raise hands. So raise hands. Okay, so some half or most half. So while well, you keep looking for that, and yeah, I think uh, um, it's important to. Uh, for needs assessment, I'm, I'm just going to ask some questions and see how much depth we need to go in. Um, Zishan, can you lower all hands? Sure, sir. Yeah, so um, another thing, I wanna know where are people from, right? So if you go, if you see participant bar, it's, it shows your name. It will, sh uh, if you hover over your name, it's gonna say more. If you click on more, it's gonna say rename. So in the rename, if you can just add your medical school alumni. If you're a graduate, mention the name of your med school. Uh, if you have graduate, just add the uh, last name um, for your med school. Um, let's see who can do that. Okay. You can see some people doing that. Good. Okay. So um, my next question is, how many of you have written a review art, uh, any sort of publications, whether it's case report, whether it's but a peer reviewed publication, not, you know, um, uh, present posters, I, you know, don't, uh, posters are great, but just for the purpose of our needs assessment. So if you have done a publication previously, please raise your hands. Okay, so we have two so far. Okay. Okay. Five. Okay. Um, six. Okay. Roughly five or six out of 30. Um, Zishan, can you lower hands? Sure, Sadiq. Yeah. And, and for those who have done a review article, can you guys raise your hands? Okay, so I see maybe two, Zishan is probably busy with the hand. So I know Zishan has done some with me too. So I'm gonna count that in. 
So um, I, I think I'm gonna stay in very basic area and um, we'll go through the review article. And then I, I want you, all of you guys to ask all the questions that you may have. You may, may be, have your own fears about doing some of the work. And I think that this is the reason that we are conducting these webinars. Since if you feel like some, something has not been completed here, then inshallah in next webinars, we'll cover that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, can you all? Can Zishan, Zishan, can you share? See my screen? Okay, so let's get started. Uh, I, so uh, the reason why are we doing this webinar? So uh, we, I, I actually looked at. Give me one second. I need to do something. Uh, so um, let me see if I can do it again, other, otherwise I will just play it. Okay. The reason we are doing this review article, so I had a chance to look at this, um, you know, um, the, the reason um, and, this, and what's the status of research in Pakistan. So there was a bibliometric review of PubMed index publications and, uh, that looked at the stu studies trend until 2017, where they looked at the number, the first authors who belong to medical colleges from Pakistan. Um, and if you look at it, so this was what they found out. So out of, there were about 220, 12 studies, those were identified. And out of all of those, until 2017, there were only about 100 studies that were done uh, from Pakistan, where first author was from Pakistan. So that is quite, you know, um, disappointing. Uh, but I also recognize this, uh, the lack of resources in Pakistan. So I, I think the goal is how can we optimize this number, um, where you know uh, some of individual authors have produced as many publications. The next one is publication insight. If you look at the publication insight, most of the publications went to, into JPMA, JCP, uh, P, uh, CPSP, PGMS, AGP. So all of the, these are Pakistani journals. If you look at the impact factor, so as your impact factor increases, the importance and the, the prestige of your journals, uh, your uh, journal will increase. So out of you know about 118 studies, 98 was, were published in an impact factor less than one which is very low impact factor. So I, I just wanna understand that, you know, what's going on in there. Uh, and sometimes I question uh, what's going on, whether we are not publishing quality research or whether it's just our fear that is getting in our way of, you know, going to hi uh, higher impact factor journals. Um, when it comes to, you know, ingredient of success in any, any area, not only in research, but also in clinical uh, uh, side, there are four key ingredients. First, you should have a desire or dream towards a particular goal. Then you should have a drive to achieve that goal. And you can have both of those goals, but you can still fail if you have, don't have the determinations, if you have many barriers and if you're not able to overcome those barriers with your determination. And last thing that is, I think in my opinion is the most important one is the discipline. And that's where we struggle a lot. I, I have mentored many uh, applicants, residency applicants uh, and trainees too. And I think this is the, the point I, that's kind of putting us behind. We have desire, we have energy, we have passion, but when it comes to discipline, we just can't get over that uh, barrier. Um, so I, I think, you know, you can all think about uh, from the past, if you have tried to done any review articles and what, where did you fail to achieve that goal and how can you overcome that? Very often it comes in discussions that, oh, I don't have any formal training in research uh, and I can't do anything. Well, you don't need any formal training in these days. What you need is you need a passion, you need to be curious and you also need to have mentors who you can reach out to and they can guide you through the process. Uh, but it all need an initiative on your part. Um, then 
um, when Zishan reached out to me, he wanted to um, wanted me to present on review articles. So I, I just wanted all of you to look at the hierarchy of evidence. When we look at the clinical evidence, and books uh, have been written, and a lot of them are uh, compiled or written based on the available data. Uh, and 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 similarly with practice guidelines, all of them they get in, info from the uh, uh, this sort of evidence. So when we look at a hierarchy of evidence, um, so on the top you see systematic reviews, then you see randomized control trials, then cohort studies, then case report studies, and at the end are, are the expert opinions. Now, um, we did a web webinar last week on case reports. So we wanted to talk a little bit more of, about the review article. When it comes to review article, if you see, um, um, I have uh, put systematic review and scoping review um, on the, uh, and it is something that is higher on the hierarchy of evidence. And I have put you know, narrative le literature review, opinion articles, commentaries, letter to editors, uh, at, and related them to the bottom. In my opinion, you know, more or less, they vary. They all look at the evidence and they generate some hypothesis, some arguments, but on the top, the systematic review and scoping reviews are on the top. And I think there was a question in the chat about this too. What's the difference between systematic review and a literature review? So um, in my opinion, the main difference is the rigorous metho methodology that comes with systematic review and uh, a scoping review, um, and then critical appraisal. Critical appraisal, where we look at the quality of assessment, uh, so where we perform quality assessment. And all of them help us reduce the bias that all of us have while we are conducting research. So rigorous met methodology and critical ap appraisal are two major uh, differences between systematic review and our narrative literature review. But to speak more specifically, you know, there can be a you know, variety of the types of review. But for the purpose of this lecture, I'm gonna focus on only three types. So narrative literature review, scoping review, and systematic review. Then you can do systematic review and then the, the quantitative data you collected, you can pull that data to create a common um, statistical number, which is called meta-analysis. That is very simplified. Uh, definition, but I think this is good enough for this lecture. So when it comes to type, types of reviews, so narrative literature review, scoping review, and systematic review, so what's the difference between all of them? So remember about my um, last slide that the difference is rigorous methodology and critical appraisal. In traditional literature review, if you see, it does not have a, a priority review protocol. So if you know that all of randomized controlled trials, all of them, like if you in the US, if you wanna do a clinical trial, you have to publish your protocol in clinic on clinicaltrial.gov. Because if you deviate from your protocol, then that raises some questions. And if you deviate from your protocol and you hide that while you're disseminating your research, that questions the research and integrity. So priority review protocol, if you see it is needed for scoping review in some cases, and, but it is mostly almost all the time it is needed for systematic reviews. And when you try to publish in, you know, in journals, all good journals will ask for a, a protocol uh, to be published. And, you know, we're gonna have a webinar in future uh, about systematic review so we can talk about, you know, where you can publish those protocols. The next step is kind of linked with the previous one, registration of review protocol. Then after that, you perform an explicit transparent peer review strategy. That does not happen in narrative literature review, but it happens in scoping review and it happens in systematic review. Similarly, uh, data extra ex extraction forms and the critical appraisal, the risk of bias assessment, which is the quality assessment in simple words, that does not happen in um, narrative literature review, and it does not happen in scoping review, but if you can do it. It's not mandated in scoping review, but it is definitely needed in systematic reviews. Uh, then the last step is that 
that you synthesize the finding from individual studies and generate kind of a summary analysis or summary number. Um, that does not happen in scoping review and traditional uh, literature review. Another point that is not mentioned here is that your research question is focused on in systematic review. It can be broad in scoping review. It can be very broad in literature review. So, see, uh, so these are some of the differences. So I'm gonna sh stop sharing my screen for a little bit if, uh, and see if anyone has any questions so far. No, should I keep going? Uh, I mean, I can I can ask. Uh, I think one one key uh, thing that you mentioned, Doctor Sadat, uh, the, about the discipline. So, any any thoughts? You know what you have seen. You know the student or the trainee they struggle in disciplining, and any any comments or suggestions how you know to improve it. Thank you. So, I, I think if we remember Zan's discussion last week, if you want to do something, do it right in the moment, and we we kind of you know separate clinical life from the scholarly work. But I think both of them go hand in hand. If you look at, especially in US, if you look at in academia and you look at the, the profile that you need to have, even if, if you're on clinical track, you need a little bit of research work, right? So one thing we need to make sure is that out of your whole day, there is some time that is for your scholarly work and you do it, you do it consistently. You and the, you know, life is, can be stressful. You can have issues in life and you, you can, you know, for, forgive scholarly work on those days, but try to maintain a discipline, try to create deadlines for yourself. That's at least worked for me. And that's why I, what I try to do is always, you know, have deadlines that I need to do by this time, create a to-do list that you need to do on that day. So very simple thing, but if you've, and I think a lot of it comes from whether you feel like this is something I need to do. If you need to do this, we do it. All you know, CPS people who are appearing for FCPS, they have a dissertation, right? All of them do that by hook and crook. So, so I, I think that if you, it should come from, okay, this is something I've got to do, right? And this is part of my training. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my slide. So, uh, so one thing that I was mentioning here is um, about, you know, when you're doing practicing medicine, practicing medicine is not only about, you know, treating patients. It's also, you know, let's say if you saw a patient and clinical question rule, uh, came to your mind and you don't know the answer, what you can do is you can go back and look at the literature or that are available. And you can see if, available data provides you answer to your questions, your clinical question. If it does not, then that creates kind of a re research questions for you. And I, I will give some examples of, you know, how we conducted some of them in the past and, uh, you know, how we conducted some review articles in the past based on some of the research question that came from the, while working in the clinical area. So these research question can can, can review existing evidence, they can address potential gaps in the knowledge, they can also highlight new trends. They can, for example, in today's world, a lot of changes are happening with COVID. Treatment modalities are changing because of the COVID. So you can also you know, use it to look into gaps in evidence and try to get, get, get some idea. Also to raise awareness, educate the community and advocate for certain critical issues. Uh, <clears throat> so here I would need someone uh, from the participant. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I want someone to read this. Who is my volunteer? Otherwise I'm gonna call for people. Uh, I can do that. Okay, so it's Amber. That's how you say your name? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's go back. So if you can read uh, uh, what I highlighted. Even emergency and family physicians who encounter the largest variety of symptoms and diagnosis get acclimated uh, to bread and butter encounters, back pain, chest pain, respiratory infections, and the management of common chronic conditions. What keeps my work meaningful is learning about the details of my patient's life uh, that aren't strictly medical. As states, uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the name. 
Sorry. Uh, yeah. I, Go ahead. Uh, as Faith MD wrote in a classic article nearly two decades ago, what does curiosity have to do with the humanistic practice of a medicine? I believe that it is curiosity that converts strangers, the objects of analysis, into people we can empathize with. Uh, to participate in the feelings and ideas of one's, one's patients, to empathize, one must be curious enough to know the patients, their characters, cultures, spiritual and um, physical responses, hope, past, and social surroundings. Truly curious people go beyond science into art, history, literature, and language as part of uh, the practice of medicine. So, you, you know, thank you, Amber. So I think the, 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 the most important point here is even when you are doing clinical practice, when you are doing research, the most important thing that make, will make you different from your uh, colleagues is how curious you are about your patients. How curious are you about a particular interest area of yours? You will stop growing when you stop being curious. Right, And this is what we do all the time. This is why we have publications coming in. We review the existing literature. We see if anything else is coming into the, into the clinical field that can help us serve our patient population better. Um, when you look at this you know, thinking order, and I, I think you know, what we do is, and that's, I would say, the glut in our system. We try to remember things. And that's lower order thinking. And I'm not just talking about in context of Pakistan, but mostly uh, countries that are struggling. So you just try to remember and recall and, be, and reproduce when you need them. People who are, some are better, they, they understand the info. They try to kind of, uh, you know, try to understand the idea or concept, and then they try to explain it. And, you know, um, Someone said that the, the understanding an idea means if, uh, like, let's say if there is a clinical, um, you know, topic for me, understanding means if you can really explain it to a sixth grader. That's, that's how it should be. And then you can apply that knowledge. That's what we do in our clinical practice. We apply our knowledge and then we analyze based on the history that tells our patient. High order thinking is where you evaluate the existing knowledge you create new hypotheses. And that's what you know, separates people in the clinical area um, from people who are leading in the field, people who are the, uh, are the experts. And I think all of you us have the capability to get to that high order thinking where we, cre we, we create new ideas, we evaluate existing ideas, we argue, we appraise, and we judge the existing evidence. And there's no, nothing wrong with doing a appraisal of existing evidence. So for example, how many of you guys saw this um, tweet on, um, I think it was a tweet or Facebook post on Punjab police uh, Facebook page? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. It was pretty messy. It was, it was honestly disappointing. I was like, have these guys yeah. gone bonkers or something? And then yeah. they wrote, and, and, and it then literally wrote hashtag awareness of all this all the trends they could find, they went for hashtag awareness. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So definitely, I think the point I'm here to make is two things. You know, this is something a lot of people wrote, you know, disappointing comments that they are frustrated about this sort of messaging about suicide. So what do you do next? Do you leave it there by putting a Facebook comment? You know, you can leave it there. That's okay if you are satisfied about that, but you can do more about this. So what we did, and this is not recently, this is something that we did uh, a couple of years back um, where, um, you know, this, this is what we wrote, like suicide and its legal implication in Pakistan and literature review. Um, so we published that. Then another friend of mine, Hassan Majid, published something similar, decrim decriminalization of suicide in Pakistan treatment, not punishment. After that tweet came in, Dr. Ali Madi Hashmi, who is a professor of psychiatry at King Edward Medical University, he wrote a, a editorial in Dawn, suicide prevention, and he does mention about you know this tweet of uh, from Punjab police. So what we can do is, and this is where you know opinions comes, commentaries come, um, and advocacy come for your patients. You can write about all of these things. 
I wrote a, a, in a newspaper about, I think there was a Supreme Court judgment about a patient with schizophrenia who was sentenced to death. And that judgment by itself tells us our lack of understanding of, uh, of mental health. So I wrote about that. So you can write about this, uh, the, these, um, our societal issues is some, is, that is something that interests you. Similarly, you know, when I was talking about being curious in clinical medicine, Zishan knows this, all the time we hear if CBD or cannabidiol works for, for, for mental health issues. So we, we worked on this topic and we wrote a review article. It, it actually started a as a narrative literature review, but editor and reviewers encouraged us to change it to systematic review and then that got published. Um, so if you look at the L metric score, it has 110 L metric score. This is kind of in 90th uh, percentile, uh, you know, since it has been published and reviewed and, you know, commented on. So this is an example. The third example that we did in COVID words is, and I was honored to have Dr. Nazi Shambran as a co-author. We looked at the psychological burden of quarantine in child and adolescent population. It's a rapid systematic review. So we, uh, there are slight variation in systematic uh, in the methodology. So we wrote that article up. And um, so there are various views where you can use clinical opportunities, advocacy opportunities to write up. Um, what are steps of writing a review article? I think there are four steps and this is something I borrowed from another presentation. So planning, reading, and research, drafting and analyzing and re revising and devising. So in the planning process, I think the most important question is a research, where, how you come up with the research question. Some of it has a clinical uh, uh, focus. For example, Zishan is really interested in parenting. So he can you know, kind of excel in that area by you know, looking at the existing evidence, providing guidance and looking into new patterns. Second thing that we can do is, you know, we can review existing evidence, we can identify gaps in knowledge, but this all has to come in the moment sort of thing. Like it does not happen that you're sitting in, in your office and then you want to write something. So as you are doing clinical practice, please think about, okay, um, let's say if you wanna um, think about, and I will get, give an example, melanocypran in, in ADHD right? Whether it has any evidence while well, uh, reading about it, can this something that can be written up? People have written for pieces, people have clinical question. So I, I think at this point, what you can do is you can create an outline, you can kind of create a one page, page Word document where you can see, okay, this is my existence, existing evidence. These are gaps and this is what I want to do. And then you can, you know, send it to someone who has done some work on this topic. So what they can do is they can modify your research question a little bit. They can tell you, for example, if you will ask me um, like, sorry, my actually uh, keys not working properly. So let's say if you ask me uh, treatment of ADHD and I wanna write on this, I will tell you there are books on written on this then you can ask me, okay, I wanna write about non-stimulant treatment of ADHD. I wanna write about edmoxetine. Even there are book chapters on edmoxetine. Now, how many of you know edmoxetine besides Zishan? I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so two people raise your hands. So Sadi, can you tell me what's edmoxetine? Uh, it's used in ADHD, so I gave step three recently. So they had mentioned a, a tamoxetine in that, and it's also used for something else. I don't remember the exact mechanism of action for it. Okay. Who, who knows the mechanism of action? Can someone tell me? Eamon, or, Eamon I, and I think Kamran also is. And any of you know? It's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Yes, so it's a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. So what it tells us is that, you know, when there's a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, that works for ADHD, right? But there are many articles that are done on the similar topic, right? There are book chapters on etmoxetine. So what else can we add? So 
I'm giving you an example here. Um, so melanocyprene is a newer uh, medication for depression. Um, and it has a, a slight variant, which is called levomelanocyprene. So how are they, you know, important, can be important for ADHD. Melanocyprene is a uh, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, but its action on serotonin is one, uh, you know, when we compare it to norepinephrine ratio, it's one into six. So it's six times more potent for norepinephrine than serotonin. Similarly, levomelanocyprene is two times more potent for um, norepinephrine reuptake than serotonin reuptake. So the question that comes to my mind is, can levomelanocyprene and levomelanocyprene work for ADHD? It's a non-stimulant treatment. It is non-habit forming. So all patients who, and, and Zishan knows this, that there are not many options for non-stimulant treatment of ADHD. So people who have history of active substance use are people who cannot use stimulant. They really cannot, you know, they don't have many options when it comes to ADHD. So what I can do is I can look for melanocyprene and levomelanocyprene, and that can be my review article for ADHD. Now, if you look at, you know, I'm gonna to go to next slide. Uh, let's, let me see where it is that at. And then I'll come back. When I, when I look at the PubMed, you know, melanocyprene and ADHD gives me only 12 studies. There can, this can be a lot, lot of evidence, but what, what I looked at it is, it's multi, mostly looking at impulsivity and, and, and you know, uh, melanocyprene, and it's mostly looking at um, animal studies. So you can write something on that. But another thing that you can do is you can do melanocyprene and depression or melanocyprene and ADHD or depression. And I will kind of walk you through those steps how to get there. So it generates about 373 studies. So if I will be in your place, what I would do is I will go in all of those studies where it's used for depression and I can see it. Are there any studies where it improved depression and improved concentration? One thing. Second, or were there any studies where it improved tension and concentration independent of depression? So that gives me some idea that that may work for ADHD and um, that can be you know, your basis of research question. So I'm just gonna go back to previous slide. So my research question is, does it improve attention and concentration in patient where it is used particularly for depression and anxiety, even if it does not improve depression and anxiety? So, I might be wrong at the end of the day, but this is something I'm gonna look into, okay? So next step, so first step of the planning is the research question. Next step is to form a team. For a review article, you may need four or five for systematic review, you can need up to 10. I have done, I was part of a systematic review where we had over 25 authors. So what you should look into research team, you should have one person who have the expertise that can be your mentor who, who is a senior author, you should have a cohesion in the team. By cohesion, I mean that ability to work together, but still able to differ. And third thing, like I mentioned on the very first slide, you need discipline. Without discipline, you will not get anywhere. Next thing you gonna decide is, what do you want to cover in this literature review? So we decided we're gonna talk about uh, melanocyprene for, uh, and its role in improving uh, attention concentration, right? Then you can determine the methodology for your review article. So I mostly do systematic review, so I try to adhere to the same methodology. Then somewhat same met methodology, not all of it. Then how will you get all of the source of evidence for information studies and articles? Where are you gonna retrieve all, all of those articles? And the next step, is barriers. Where do you think where will be the limitation for you in um, performing the, that um, particular literature review? Since I work with applicants, a lot of them, they have like step three or they have an exam. So I want them to tell ahead of time that, okay, I'm gonna have an exam in this time. You know, I'm gonna be away. And most people, when you're working with them, they understand that. What they, but personally, I don't tolerate is the top one, the discipline. Uh, while you're doing the review article. The next step is, and that kind of correlates with our last slide is, where can I find 
the inf uh, all the information studies and articles. So we look at the electronic database to re retrieve relevant articles. And your mentor can also help in uh, you connecting with experts in the field or kind of, you know, connect you with someone with something similar that has been done or somewhat similar that has been done. So you can also use that. Now, what's a database? It is a library that holds articles, books, scientific proceedings, and relevant in, in information. Um, if you don't know about, you know, what's an electronic database, so databases is, uh, is like a price line. Uh, how many of you know about price line? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so two. So Priceline is a website, like in, in for hotel uh, line is hotel.com, uh, flights.com. So what does Priceline does is Priceline carries the in, flight info for all the flights that are gonna board for your destination, right? If you think of electronic databases, that kind of works in a similar way. Not same thing. You know, it's a very simplified version of it, but just trying to make my point. Uh, so for example, if I wanna fly from New York to Lahore, right? And I put my date in, I, it gives me a flight for, you know, uh, Emirates, it gives me flight of the hard. Now what happens if you are gonna look at, you know, an electronic database? So there are different electronic databases like Cochrane, Embis, PubMed, Scopus, Web of Science, and all of you know what I listed. Some of them are subject specific. For example, PsychInfo is something that is psychiatry related. Uh, CINHL is which is mostly nurses and allied health sciences. Uh, Eric is something that publishes uh, you know relevant to educational uh, area. From my personal experience, some of them, some of you might be thinking of, okay, if I want to do something in psych, I just maybe look at psych info. But for me, I think PubMed is the most comprehensive one. PubMed, Scopus, and Web of Science, and Embase too. So if you want to pick two or three, pick two or three out of them. Cochrane libraries and also extensive resource where you can look at. Um, so. When I went to PubMed, so I put melanocyprene in ADHD, and we can do it right now in a little bit. So it's, it gives me 12 results, right? And when I do melanocyprene in ADHD or depression, so a little bit change in search terms gives me more results. Um, so I, I, I have, you know, um, can you guys see my screen? Zishan? Yes, we can. Okay. So let's see, I, I put in here SSRI and depression. Okay, I'm just giving an example. So it's gonna give me all the journal articles by journals that are indexed in, in PubMed. Does that make sense? So it also tells me from 1963 to 2021, 20, this many articles published, you can also look for clinical trials only. So that comes down to 4,700. Uh, 4, uh, you can also look Sorry, for- Sorry, you can't see the screen. You can, we are seeing the slide, but not the screen. Okay, let me change that then, sorry. Okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay, so what I did was I did SSRI and depression. So it gives me about 18,000 results. Now you can change a little bit. You can look at publication in last five years. So that comes down to 2,600. You can look at randomized controlled trials. That comes down to 348. So 348 in the last uh, five years. I, I, I only wanna look at systematic reviews that were published in the last uh, five years. So there are 124 systematic reviews that were done on this topic. Um, so this is how you can play with PubMed. You can also, um, you know, um, sort of collate the results from different databases, but that needs a little bit of trick with EndNote. 
that is, I think, out of school for uh, today's review article, but there are videos. And I think, you know, when we talk about a uh, systematic review in uh, future, it may kind of include a few slides on this. Zishan, can you still see my screen? Uh, yes, the PowerPoint screen, yes. Okay. So next thing will be selecting relevant articles and extracting studies. So out of that list of 343 for melanocytes and depression and ADHD, we have 300 studies. We're gonna go through them and we're gonna see which one relates to my research question, okay? Next thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna decide and extract data points relevant to your papers. How can you decide based on that? You can look at the sample articles how they have done it, other you know, articles have done. You can also look at the similar articles and see, get an idea of how did they do it. You can also look at that, uh, you know, uh, think about data points that are relevant to your questions. And I will give an example of that in a little bit. And these data points that you extract that can become a source of your table, but you're making it when you're making a table in the study, all this list studies in chronological order. And it, it is really important to cross check, double check, triple check kind of uh, your work for accuracy because it can be really disturbing when you know someone else will correct you. And try to use your team to best of your uh, advantage. You can divide the work up in, among your team members. So this is for ex an example of data extraction sheet. I'm a huge fan of Google Drive. I use it all the time. So this is a Google Excel sheet where everyone can see it. So like we collected for study or title, authors, country of study, background, setting of data that was relevant to that study, right? Um, the next, and here, if you look at the last uh, bullet point, so possible data points for Melanocyprin efficacy in ADHD are improvement in attention and concentration in depressive patients with, um, in patients with depression with melanocyprin. What will be my data points? So first, authors, country of study, study design, dosage of melanocyprin, route, how, how are you gonna admi administer your dose? You, what were your characteristics of population in that study? Diagnosis, whether there were any comorbid diagnosis. Any outcome measures related to ADHD that you wanna collect info for, whether there were any dropouts, what were the side effects on those study? Um, and here I will ask any of you, any of you can point out that outcome measure that I'm missing or that data point that I'm missing that you know we should extract. Just open your mic and speak. And if you don't have, that's okay. Okay. So we'll move on. So from this point, you can move on and you can transfer your work to manuscript. And this is almost 40% of your work. Then what are you gonna do next? Um, I want you to look at the structure of articles. So I generally, when I am kind of, you know, uh, making and um, start collecting and collating all the info, I generally have a standard template that I use but there is a standard format on uh, for each article um, that mostly most journals would use. So you have a title, you have abstract, you have introduction, you have method results, discussion, conclusion, and references. And here uh, I'm gonna show you an article. Um, Zishan, can you see my screen? Uh, yes. So this is the uh, article that you know Zishan mentored us for. So we looked at, it's an original study, but I just want you to look at or focus on the structure of the manuscript. So we have a title, we have an abstract, we have an introduction, methods, results, discussion, limitation, conclusion, and references. So this is the kind of universe, universal structure of manuscript. And this is how you should think about when you're doing your work. So let's, when I, I do uh, write articles, I'll always start with methods and results. I do rest of it and later on. So write with your, write your methodology, write your results. When you are 
you know, done writing these two things. So focus on point, uh, point number two, prepare an outline of different clinical areas that you would like to address, right? So you can also see what are the similarities that are coming across, what are the differences, any new hypothesis, and then you can send it to your mentor or senior author to provide critique or feedback. If you don't have it, one, maybe you, know, you can ask someone to, to take a look at it quickly and give you some feedback. And believe me, there, are, there will be a lot of people who would be willing to help you. So next thing after method and results that I do is introduction and discussion. Now let's start with introduction. So how to develop an introduction. So it is an inverted uh, pyramid. That's how I think and it. So I start with a very broad base and then you go narrow at the base and you kind of you know, bring it from broad to specific to your hypothesis and question. From the top, what's unknown, what's known, and then what's unknown. And the third one is how does it relate to your clinical hypothesis? So your introduction is also your problem statement. So at the identification on the top is identification of problem domain, critical discussion of what has been done, identification of knowledge gaps and objectives. Now, can any of you, so our review article was focused on melanocytopenia and its efficacy in the treatment of ADHD. And there is nothing wrong about saying wrong things, okay? That's what, how we learn. Can someone tell me in introduction, how will you structure in, introductions? So on the top here is your problem. Second thing is what is known. Third thing is what are the gaps in the knowledge? Last thing is what is your hypothesis? Can, so can you, someone tell me how would they structure their introduction? No judgments, anyone can speak. Well, I suppose I would mention how ADHD is a problem. Then I'll go into what we know about what causes ADHD. Then I guess I'll discuss some of the drugs that are usually used and their mechanisms. And I guess I'll talk about the drugs that we want to talk about and I'll talk about their mechanisms and how we think you know, it's useful for our specific disorder. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Fatima? I'm yes. no Andromisha. Sorry? I'm not Fatma under Misha. Okay, so, uh, so uh, Fatma actually raised her hand, so that's why I'm asking her. Thank you. Um, what I think is you would introduce why ADHD, um, you know, what ADHD is and the drugs that are commonly used and why we're specifically researching this drug. And we'll point out um, why it's relevant and what our research would benefit, who would be benefiting from this research and what is the purpose of the research? Why would somebody re read the research paper? I think that would should be mentioned in the introduction. Yeah, great, thank you. Kamran? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, I would define what is, what is ADHD and what common practices have been there to treat ADHD and what mechanisms are over there. And I would relate that mechanisms with uh, the available other uh, medicines and I would hypothesize if there is same mechanism. So uh, could we treat ADHD with other, these kind of <clears throat> medicines? And then I will carry on the discussion further in the in next, in next sections of that. Yeah, so I think all of you guys have raised very important points. So here's how I would structure it. If it is going to a journal and if it's like a psychiatry journal, you know, all of them know what's ADHD or what are the symptoms. So you have to keep it focused. You know, you are probably uh, somewhat uh, preaching to the choir, right? So what I would do is I will, you know, start with ADHD, burden of the illness, what impairment does it has, kind of couple of lines about, you know, uh, the treatment options that are available, the role of non-stimulants where that can be used and what, how there are limited options. Then I will move into melanocypran or levomelanocypran. I will talk a little bit that it is, you know, used for depression. It and you know, what's the mechanism of action? How does it work? Is the norepinephrine? It has, you know, is a potent norepinephrine agent while it has serotonin reuptake too. How it can be helpful for ADHD? And this is something I'm going to look at. So something similar. 
in, in this way. So I think all of you guys got the idea uh, that what we are trying to do. So let's let's go back to our sh uh, share screen. Then. So so on the top you have identification of uh, problem domain and then critical discussion of what has been done identification of knowledge gap objective so you can stay in these with this pyramid but you can change it a little bit so how to develop discussion then um so what you do is in the first paragraph you summarize the key findings so you have created methods and results you have looked at you know okay these are my key findings that are coming across so you summarize the findings so a paragraph that should be a summary of your results, but it should not repeat the results, right? So this this can be difficult, you know. So what I, I would do is I would write, you know, whatever I know, and then I will try to summarize and concise that info. So you have to do that. The next thing is use synthesized knowledge of immediate areas, key arguments, concepts. And the, then you compare and critique. So how does it do the different studies relate? What is new? What is different? What is controversial? What needs to be tested more? What is What evidence is lacking, inconclusive, contradictory, or limited? And what research design or methods seems unsatisfactory? So you can say if, to something of that extent that there are like five studies done and these are some of the you know quality issues in those studies but while you're doing that you know just be humble about how you say it you don't have to come across you know even if someone has done a you know really big mistake there are ways to say and bring your clinical points so that's how you will you know develop your discussion so um, I'm going to go back to, uh, let's see, so we have completed these four sections, so I'm going to come back to um, this article with Zishan. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. The article? Yes. Okay. So in discussion, you know, we here, you know, we, in the first paragraph, we talk about, you know, sort of summary of our results. So if you see in the results, we have numbers, right? Uh, we have tables, different numbers, but the summary of the table is really sort of, you know, if I read this first paragraph, I should be able to know what, what are the results of your study. Then you see what I do is I pick different, you know, focus areas. So what you do is you pick a focus area, you compare it with existing info, you kind of see what's the difference and then you try to explain that. And then you can also kind of point, uh, you know, indication for future results. And that's what you do throughout your discussion. So you some, in a first line, so for example, you know, I'm reading this one, almost 20% of respondent in our study sample had experienced seclusion and physical restraint associated with uh, longer length of stay. So that's how we opened up this uh, uh, paragraph. Then we say that our studies are consistent with the nationwide case control study, which concluded that longer stay of hospital in an adolescent inpatient unit was increased, was associated with increased hours of restraint. And then we kind of explained the kind of, you know, mechanism, hypothesis, concept more. Then you can also critique, you can also say, that there are these studies that are uh, contradictory to our hypothesis. And here can be the reasons. And then you close that, uh, uh, close that you know, uh, paragraph. So open with the topic, summarize, critique, compare, critique, close the topic. In between, explain, explain you know, uh, the possible mechanism. The last one is, the, in, here it is also limitations. So this is not the limitation of the studies that you extract your results from. This is the limitation of, this, of your review article. What could you have done better? So uh, if I, I'm gonna read it from here. Um, so for example, if you look at third sentence prior to data abstraction, authors did not establish integrated reliability during the pilot uh, phase. However, however, an attempt to minimize 
error was made by having additional reviewers cross-check all the data, right? So you look at, you also critique your work and, and you should be very humble while you're doing that, right? You can make mistakes existing, you know, people from existing research can make mistakes. So this research is a humbling process and no one is, it, it has absolute knowledge. So keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to go back to my slide. Sorry for flip-flopping. I, I just wanted to show you guys some example. So, so now we are done with our introduction, methods, results, and discussion, right? Next thing is abstract. So what is abstract? So abstract typically have four components. So the first one is objectives, background, introduction, methods, results, and conclusion. So abstract summarizes the major section of the article and it is a stand alone section of the manuscript. So let's see if I'm just reviewing your manuscript, I should be able to look at your abstract and I should be able to see or understand what did you do in that study. Most uh, journals will ask anywhere from 150 to 250 words. So each word is important, right? And, and this is, so again, we, so then, uh, so the same thing that I mentioned that they should be able to answer the research question. Okay. Okay. So I'm having problem with my key again. So I'm going to go back to. Zishan, can you stop sharing my screen? If I do it, mm. how about now? Yeah, I stopped sharing your screen. Okay, so let me go back to to non. Um, Play view. Okay. Next one is conclusion. Can you see? Uh, yes, the slide I can see. Yes. So in conclusion, it's about hundred words. It you summarize uh, um, summarize the findings of your existing evidence and what you reviewed, recognize existing knowledge and provide direction for future research. So it's kind of a take home message. Last one is references. So make sure, uh, so th there are two types of references. One is in text citation and then uh, at the end of the article, there are references. So what do I mean by in text citations, right? So this is an in text citation. If you look at this, you know, this is an in text citation. This is an in text citation. So citation that is, uh, is appearing in the text, that's in text citation. And all journals will tell you in what format they want the references to be, and you have to follow that. Then at the end is the references. So, and there are different referencing management software that you can use. Um, like um, and, and notice there, Mendeley is there, and there are others too. Some points to remember, use conversational, but grammatically correct language. You can have amazing and you know, really thoughtful research question, but you can mess up your paper if you don't do justice with your paper by, you know, reviewing it, by looking at the language, by looking at the flow of the paper. So be very careful about this part. And like I said multiple times, be humble, acknowledge the efforts of others, even when you disagree or differ. And then paraphrase, if let's say if I'm looking at another study an article and I want to use something what they use to kind of, you know, make my point, then paraphrase and use appropriate proper in-text citation to document the source and then maintains accurate rec records of those references and citations. I generally do, you don't use quotations. If you use quotation, then there is a way to uh, cite that you use quotations sparing, uh, sparingly and effectively. And the most important thing is, and I think that's the take home message, publication is a byproduct of what you do, but the focus should be on spreading scientific knowledge and serving science. 
So, you know, I, I work with um, residency applicants and some residents and trainees. So I think you're gonna get publication in any way. So how can you improve the work? You can, you know, guide the science and so people can and patients can benefit. And last thing is, and I highlighted in red, and I think this is the only thing, or probably second thing is that is red, never, ever, ever copy paste. Plagiarism is considered academic fraud. So never, ever do that. Uh, final text. So we talked about everything. Title should reflect the content of your article. Ensure, ensure that your content has a smooth review. Review, review, proofread, proofread, proofread as much as possible. Absolutely no gram grammatical spelling mistakes and formatting errors. You can, you know, you can use, you don't have to write Shakespeare to write a review article. You can, you know, use simple conversational language, but try to, you know, use, um, um, give more time to avoid any spelling mistakes. Grammarly is available. There are other, you know, tools that are available, but I, I think there's still, there's no replacement for human eye. So while you use Grammarly, and that's fine with that, but also use your human eye to do that. And last is rejection is not a failure, but opportunity to use feedback to improve your work. You've stopped growing when you stop taking feedback in. So if you got a rejection, if you got a you know, very uh, strict reviewer, don't get you know, disappointed, don't feel defeated or failure. Use that feedback and see how can you improve your article. With this, uh, we will end my uh, uh, presentation. These are acknowledgements. I'm happy to answer any questions, but one thing is, I don't wanna answer questions that are in the chat. So ask me questions, open your mic up. I wanna have a human interaction in here. Anyone with questions? Sorry, I have a, a 10 month old, so you're gonna hear some background noise. So uh, Sundas asked, does Google Scholar come in e-databases? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, how do we get the access to libraries? Like to research all the data? Yeah, so I, I think that's a limitation, you know, that comes across while we are working in lower middle and income countries. PubMed is available to all of us. Uh, similarly, um, I think you can also probably ask Psych Info, Google Scholar is available to all of us. Um, if you, um, and once you retrieve all those articles, you can also, you know, a uh, lot of those articles are also in ResearchGate on academia. So if you retrieve some articles from Google Scholar or PubMed, you can try to request from a research gate or academia. There are some other, you know, uh, tools that you can use. And since we are on an official plat platform, I don't want to say, say it, but what I would do is I will post that on my Facebook. So use that it is free it has almost all the articles that you would need thank you assalamu alaikum everyone assalamu alaikum sharif go ahead yeah. so here's the thing with newbies it's very easy for us to compare our first article and that process with what you guys have you know achieved after 20 30 articles so how long did it take you to write your first article and what was it like? So I think three things that in my opinion are, I may add one more uh, there. I think first is you need to remember that you're not gonna be able to publish your first article in New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA. So, and I have not, I have not published in New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA. I have 80 publications so far. So, so, you're not gonna be get there. So first thing is, you know, you need to see where you can start. You are a starting point, acknowledge that. 
Second thing is that this is why you need a mentor or senior author. So you can reach out to them and then you can see, ask them, how can you improve your article? And they, they will guide you. Someone who has written 20 articles can guide you better how to improve your first article. And you will be amazed to see, uh, Ramesha, how many people are willing and, you know, to help you. I think the, the, where we fail is that when we are reaching out to first article, we want senior author to do all the work for us and tell us what to do. I, I think it should be other way around. You do the groundwork and you reach out to them when you need them. I don't know if it answered your questions or not. Yeah, well, it did. Thank you so much, Zach. So it's sort of like Hogwarts because you're gonna have you're gonna get that help only if you ask for it, and and that's great, I guess. Yeah. So I, you know, we wrote an article, and that that was you know uh, just to have you know um, to have publication for residency applicants. So we wrote that article on psychopharmacology of PTSD and in children and adolescents. So people who know, Jeffrey Storn is a, is a national and an international speaker on this topic. Um, uh, he is, you know, one of the leading researchers and a, a prominent figure in American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So when we did that, we reached out to him and he was really gracious enough to provide feedback. So I think it's all about your hesitation to ask help, then people, not you know, um, letting you hold, uh, or people not holding your hand. It's all about you know uh, about reaching out and asking for help. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Kamran, you unmuted yourself. Go ahead. So Kamran, can you write your questions because your voice is breaking? Does anyone else has questions? Or I'm gonna start calling people now. Uh, I have one more question. Yes. Um, for a very uh, beginner, uh, what are the basic softwares or uh, skills that we need to have to start the research process like Excel or EndNote? And uh, what are the resources we can use to attain those skills? So when you come to, uh, when you talk about resources, what do you mean by resources? Like, uh, are there any courses or uh, YouTube videos that we should, uh, <coughs> you know, watch and go through so that we understand what are the basic like Excel and I know these are the things and how should we, you know, be able to work on these. Sure. So I, I think, you know, there are tons of YouTube videos. There are a lot of courses on Coursera that are available. It's, I, I, I don't think it's about lack of resources. It's about, you know, having the desire, um, having the drive, determination and discipline to do that. So there are tons of resources uh, available and Coursera has, you know, uh, courses on how to conduct systematic review. One that I particularly like, and I think you should all look at um, for is Author Aid. So Author Aid is, uh, is based in uh, Middle uh, Mediterranean or Middle East countries. So it's a Mediterranean association and they <clears throat> encourage people who are publishing research in lower and middle income countries. They have a writing course, how to write, um, um, do the scientific writing. So do attend that course. It happens twice a year. I think it's the top notch course that you can take and it's free. I like everything that is free. And uh, for the for the skill set, I, I think, you know, um, when we came into the med school, we didn't, we have very, uh, uh, you know, simple at basic knowledge and we learned and we make made mistakes and we learned and we learned. So that's what it is, it is needed. Uh, you, everyone knows how to type in Microsoft Word, how to type in uh, Excel sheet. You don't need that. All of us have that. Um, um, I'm gonna see if 
Sundas is here. Um, I asked her to take you know that course in how to uh, write um, a scientific paper. Sundas, do you want to talk about your experience with author aid? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to do one. So uh, I took that course. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to complete it yet, but I will start it next week. But the thing about it was that it was very systematic. They start with how to move on with the title, the introduction, what are the resources. Then, for instance, if you go, uh, if you use the Google Scholar of Ahmed, and there are a lot of uh, publications which you cannot view because you don't have uh, a login ID or you're not connected with your medical school right now. So they tell you the ways of how you can extract out publications that you cannot view normally. Uh, then they also let you know about uh, so many other electronic databases that you can use, uh, especially uh, for the researches that were done before 1950s as well. So they just not restrict you to recent researches, but they move on to the previous ones as well. And slowly and gradually they move on and tell you how to do everything step by step. And then there is a test in the end, and then they mark your test as well. So this is how it goes and it's completely free. Like you can do it um, uh, free of charge. So um, uh, Sundas, I, I think uh, Sadia posted the link for that. So if you can um, post the link for that course, um, you know, that would be really helpful. Um, I think it's ongoing. I don't know if you can take it this year or not, but there's always a next time. Um, uh, um, Kamran was- Okay, I'll post it in the chat here. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Then Kamran asked a question. Can we only use only PubMed rather than going for multiple platforms to search? Will it affect the quality or, or something? Exactly. So if you are only relying on PubMed, you miss a lot of good articles that might be on other uh, uh, platforms or electronic databases, right? So this is why when you do a systematic review, you are required to have extract articles from at least two electronic databases. Manual search of articles is also something that is preferred. So I think um, 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 when when people do it, if you look at you know people who do uh, you know really good evidence based reviews, they can include anywhere from six to ten electronic databases. That's for systematic review. But we are only here talking about review articles. So do as much as you can do for review article. Um, then, um, um, Nabiha, do you have a question? <clears throat> yes, uh, Salakum, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Sadik, for a very insightful session. Um, I really enjoyed um, the discussion and understanding uh, clearly about how to write ab abstracts and how it's broken down. Um, I had a question regarding gray literature. Mm -hmm. about um, when, when we are selecting different databases, uh, what are the criterias for selecting gray literature for our, uh, for our search versus not? Is, does it, it decrease your credibility if you, you know, take studies from gray literature? Because there are many that are not there in, under bigger databases. Thank you. Yes, too. so I think gray literature comes to like scientific proceedings, um, contacting authors. Uh, you want to also ask them if there are any unpublished trials that may. So we know that a lot of time when articles are published, they're published that is favorable results. Articles with negative findings that are not published. So you, you can reach out to that. When, but here I also want to reinforce a point that you are, we are talking here about narrative literature review, not a systematic review. And the kind of review article, systematic review that I have done, I have very rarely included gray literature. You can skip it. It's not going to be, you know, really taken against you. Um, so uh, I think you guys will be okay. SMK has asked a question. If you are still there, do you want to open your mic and ask your question? Okay. If not, then I can answer that question about, you know, I think his question was, do you care about letter count at all? Is there a Bell Park letter count that you keep in mind? So, 
Um, I, I think I'm going to talk about what's the uniform requirement. So your narrative literature review or your review articles can go from anywhere from 300 to uh, 3,000 to 8,000 words. And it will vary from journal to journal. So I try to stay under 4,000 because it's a safe number. I have not written anything that is like 8,000, 5,000, or 6,000. I think most I have written is uh, probably around 3,500 words. For in, um, for abstract, you know, like I mentioned previously, 150 to 250 words is kind of requirement that is put up by most journals. Um, here I'm talking about the word count, not the character count. So. When it comes to journals, they you know they don't care about the character count; they care about the word count. What I generally do is, and I uh, I also encourage people to do it is when you are trying to write an article and you start up, you can probably write a paragraph and you can see what info you think should be mentioned in that paragraph, right? And then try to see how can you kind of squeeze it together and make it like a concise. So each word should mean something. So even if you are using only, it should mean something. Fewer should mean something. Unique should mean something, right? So you cannot just add words to kind of increase your word count, if that makes sense. Okay, any more questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I, I wanted to know what happens after you, for example, you submitted an article and it gets rejected. You receive a feedback. Can you resubmit it to the same um, journal or you, you're kind of like that article is not able to be used anymore? What happens at that point? So there are many journals that are out there, right? Um, so one thing that I generally do is um, sometimes, is let's say if I receive a rejection and I can see that can be addressed. So I would write to editor, but it happened maybe three or four times. I asked them, I think the, uh, in, uh, you know, I appreciate reviewers feedback that this was really helpful. So kind of being humble, but, but I, I feel like, you know, these comments can be addressed. So there has been times, you know, they said, okay, you can address these comments and then resubmit. But well, most of the time, about 95% of the time, when they rejected, you cannot have published in the same journal. Um, so, but there are many journals that are out there. So, um, but at the same time, you know, I also want you to encourage, there are many studies that are published in very low impact factor nominal journals. And, uh, you know, I have written on that, uh, about that journal, I have, feelings for that journal. There are a lot of studies that came from Pakistan that were really good studies. And I think just for the lack of, uh, for, for the purpose of comfort and getting it published, you know, very quickly, it got published there. But I think those studies could have gone to a better journal. So we should be able to kind of, you know, defeat our peers, peers and be able to access a better journal. And that you can also ask your mentor what can be a better journal for this particular article. Thank okay. you. Okay. Would you, yeah, do you want to ask her a question? Okay, her mic is not working. So her question is, um, you have talked earlier, most of the researcher from Pakistan don't wanna, don't go for high impact journals, but the most important problem for the researcher face there is, here is related to funding stuff. Like we don't have same, uh, some scientific societies or institutional bodies which can help us with funding. Can you guide in this uh, regard? Sorry, I have to type. Um, so I think what, you, if I understand your question, you are asking that, you know, I have done the study, but I don't have the funding to publish this. Uh, 
And so that's why we go for only low impact factor journals. Did I get your question right? But yeah, you can just type. Okay, so, you know, there are only few PubMed index journals in Pakistan. So General of Postgraduate Medical um, Institute, um, JPMA, P Pakistan General of Medical Sciences, and we'll talk King Edward Medical College, all of them have article processing charges. They are not a lot, but they are there. Um, when it comes to the journals, and I think I will request Ishan, I think he got, he's all surrounding, so he got distracted that, there are many journals who are subscription journals where you don't have to pay any article processing charges. So there are subscription journals where you don't have to pay a single penny. Then there are journals that are hybrid journals where, where you can pay article processing fee to have it open access where everyone can see it, but you can also choose to, uh, you know, um, uh, publish it uh, without paying any fee. That would mean that only people who have subscription for the journal would be able to see that. And then at the last end of the spectrum, there are like open access journals where you have to pay the fee. But if you are from lower income country, you can write to, so for, for like, let's say if I'm a resident, if I'm a student and I have done, written something up and I wanted to go to that journal, I can just write up to the auth, uh, editor that I'm a student, I don't have any funding source, I don't have any earning source. Can you waive off my article processing charges? And in very, uh, in higher percentage of uh, instances, they do waive off those article processing charges. So I, I don't think it is about the funding. I think it's about exploring a little bit more and, uh, you know, kind of, stretching yourself behind your comfort zone. Does this answer your question? That, or I was just rambling. Okay, <clears throat> any other questions? Um, I have a question, hello, sir. Hi. Uh, so uh, if we have chosen a topic or we are interested in a topic on which like very few articles are available, let's suppose it's about COVID-19 and maybe some drug relevant to psychiatry or something, right? But uh, the PubMed is giving me like hardly five to six results. So how do I go about that? Like how would I come over this barrier then? So I, I think you can then look at the other databases and see if that, that, that can increase your number a little bit more. But I think five, uh, studies is a good number to write something up. So, and you can make a point. Here is a drug that may or may not work. You know, there is not enough research on this and invite more research. So, so you can use it either way you want. So you can, you can use your spin powers to spin it. Okay, thank you. And is there any specific number or like minimum requirement of the citations or references to be used? So uh, the references vary from journal to journal, you know, for mostly for original studies is 30, for, you know, review articles, the limit is 50. Um, I'm just trying to think, you know, um, what's the max I've done or what's the uh, minimum? I think if you have four or five, you can write something up um, and then you can also see if there are, let's say if you're looking at a randomized control trial and there are two or three, you can also see if there are any like cohort studies or case, uh, case control studies, case reports that you can include. If that is not there, then you can also use animal studies in, in your review article. So there are, there are ways to write things. So I think if you reach out to your mentors and sometimes you can't write it, and it's okay not to write it and just wait for the right time. <clears throat> yeah. 
Yes, if you're referencing a study or citing it, you have to paraphrase that sentence. You cannot copy paste uh, unless you are using a quotation. Any other questions or? Uh, Zishan, what's, what are the marching orders? Uh, unless you just I mean, I just want to thank you for, you know, all the detailed uh, discussion. I mean, it was definitely very helpful. Um, I mean, it seems like a lot of questions were answered. Sorry, I was a bit distracted because of the call. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I don't see any other questions. So we can give anyone the last chance. Uh, I think Fatma has raised her hand. So. Um, I, I had another question that just come up. I just came up. Uh, I, uh, you mentioned about the the Pakistani journals that are there that do not have like a high impact level. Could that be a starting point for people who haven't been able to, you know, start writing a journal to start publishing there or maybe kind of attempting there first? Is that something that we should consider? Absolutely. I just want you to guys to publish, but you know. When you start publishing, build on your work, right? So you don't wanna be stuck with, uh, with only one journal. You want to build, and even the journal that I was mentioning, and I hope people got the, the name of the journal, you, you can start from there. It's okay to start from there, but with time, just grow. Uh, you, we all need to grow and excel to next uh, step in the ladder. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so thank you again, um, everyone for participating and uh, thank you so much Dr. Naveed for your time, uh, generous time. So we have a recording we will post on uh, Facebook and uh, we'll keep you posted about our next session, uh, hopefully next uh, week or so. But thank you again. Thank you. Allah. Allah.